VIP access. VIP access with Aniko and Africa Loud. Uwaso Pangala Swazeyes. When was the last time we had that salamu? The person sitting next to me just took me back memory lane. And I'm so excited to be hosting this specific individual. She's a superstar. She's one of the forerunners when it comes to DJs in the Afro house scene. I mean, in Kenya and around Africa, you might have enjoyed her collaboration with DJ Spoo, I'll Be There, and many other collaborations that she's done globally. It's such an honor to meet this fantastic singer, songwriter, composer, and she's also a DJ, Tina Ador. What's up, girl? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Aniko. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm feeling uh, excited, you know, feeling excited. Thank I'm you so, so much. I'm so excited that you're here and, you know, you look beautiful. Oh, thank you. So do you. Gosh, I've been, <clears throat> you know double tapping on socials all the time. So Asante. It's an honor for me to be here. It's an honor for me to have you. And I also want to thank you so much for making it possible for me to interview DJ Sbu, um, who was on VIP Access the last two episodes. You know, he, I think, you know, gave me probably one of the best interviews I've had since I could remember. You know, he's just such... Um, um, a persona and such energy and um, you brought DJ Spoo to VIP access so I thought it would just make sense for us to have our, our own episode yeah. because he was insisting, he was like, Tina, come and say something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and we already had such a long interview so I, I just thought it would be nice to have you come back for our own conversation so yeah. welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Today is all about you. <laughs> she's Huzzah. she's like uh, freaking out. No, but it's it's gonna be dope. It's gonna be dope. So those who are listening or watching, you know, I always try to find paint a picture. You know, the kind of person who's sitting here with me. Who is she? What has she done? So Tina's voice. I always say, don't take for granted small people. You know, short shorties, <laughs> don't take them for granted because yes. they're such buddies and they're so powerful. Because when you hear her sing, you wouldn't believe. This voice is coming from 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 you know this young girl, but she's a powerhouse. So you know it's it's the voice, but then it's the DJing um, in a space that you rarely see DJs in the Afro house scene. So I appreciate you. You know when it comes to festivals like Beneath the Baobabs, Kaleidoscope, Gondwana, she's there representing with Kina Shimza, with Kina. Um, Fuzak, Kina Suraj. So it's just such a wonderful thing to see this young woman, you know, existing in this space, enjoying it. And she's super talented and she does it all. You know, when she's performing on stage, she's, you know, DJing, then she's performing, she's uko singing. Damn, you're so dope, girl. Thank you're you, so thank dope. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are so dope. Ah, thank you. This ah, is your you. time. This is your time. I feel like this yeah. is Tina Dor's time yeah. to shine, you know, to speak, yeah. to be seen, to be heard. I feel like I'm I'm still um, getting used to the attention. I think since uh, my collaboration with DJ Spoo, it's like quadrupled. I swear it's quadrupled till this moment. Um, and while yes, it's a huge blessing, and I appreciate it, and like it, it it's still. I'm still trying to take it all in because I'm not used to it, but I'm still trying to take it all in. I have a beautiful and amazing team, amazing manager who's always there for me. He doubles up as my counselor because <laughs> he's always like, Tina, if it's too much, just, you know, put your phone down, give me a call or something like that. But yeah, I give I give thanks to God for everything um, that I've done since I began in 2017 with my work. Can we talk about that since you began professionally in 2017, but music and art was something that has been very close to your heart from a young age. Yes. You want to recount that to, to me, please? Yes. Um, I think some people take it somehow for granted. I don't know. But for me, music is something I picked um, in two parts. So one was in school music festivals, drama festivals, and stuff like that. You're flourishing uh, over there. <laughs> yeah, there's no way I would uh, go into, like, because it was happening in, like, a first term and second term, first term and second term. There's no way I'd go into the competition and not go all the way to the nationals. It was such a no-brainer for me. It was just like, yeah, see, we're going to get this number one. Kwani, it's so obvious. I didn't know how important it was or how much it would uh, be ingrained in my DNA so much. But it was for years. And I only started in, like, what, class five? I was so small. 
Watch out, I'm small right now. Also small. Now they're trying my best ah, to perform. <laughs> but anyway, so for, for class five, all the class eight, and then high school. Unfortunately, high school, I only went for one year. <clears throat> Thanks to my high school. I'm not name dropping. Anyway, uh, but the day I also realized, um, that's why I had composer in my in my description the day i realized i'm also a composer is when you see the way in school you have houses so you have inter house music competition and drama um i did a composition in four different languages so it was in kikuyu kamba swahili doluo and something else yes and I trained my housemates because you're like 80 of you or something like that. I trained my housemates. Everybody sang in those four languages. Because for me, music festival was about singing different vernacular and performing it to your best and, you know, telling that African story, which to me, honestly, was so such a thing. And it got into my brain so much. Like, I can tell African stories in the vernacular Telling about, you know, it's a, this is a song, as a wedding song, it's a song for circumcision, things like that. And so I composed this song in four languages, and it was such a no-brainer that it became number one during that. And I sat back, I was like, hmm, that was dope, you know? And, and to realize how good it was is, you walk into the washroom and then you just hear someone starting to sing that song, a piece of the song, and you're like, oh, so people actually, you know, got it into their heads and stuff like that. So as much as I didn't get to practice it more, um, that was actually in like form three, I think. So when I did that, but as much as I didn't get to do it in form four and stuff, I was like, "Ipo siku nitamaliza this high school." You know, I will finish this high school and I'll go back to what I love doing. And I cleared high school and I went to campus, and I don't know. I think God just uh, put the path for me. Um, I found myself getting into music groups and stuff like that. And then, so the other part that introduced me into this is my brother, my big brother, MGM. Of course, of course, who's also quite, um, you know, known, celebrated in the in, in the house and I'm a piano music scene. Yes. He's a producer, yes. he has his EP out, yes. he's a media personality, mm -hmm. a trace. Yes, so MGM, my big brother, um, people don't believe that he's my brother, but he is my brother. We, we share the similar DNA. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> from school, he used to come to school for visiting days and stuff like that, and he would bring new music that's out because he was either in high school or had finished high school by the time I'm still in boarding school. So he'd come to school, maybe he's bringing me what? Medicine, for example. And he'd come with his earphones and say, yo, check this out. And I remember those days at some point, I'd, I have this fresh memory, was uh, when Camp Mula were just starting off. Man, I used to listen to that music. I'm like, this music is beautiful. Like, it's amazing. And to realize these are young people, I was just inspired. I was like, I want to be like them, you know, something like that. And he kept doing that. And then we both got introduced to house music by our late cousin, who was in South Africa, who was also a DJ. And so every time he came home, he used to come with the CDs with Kwaito uh, music in them and mixes. So he used to share it with my brother, and my brother used to share it with me. And we got into that whole revolution of uh, EDM to Kwaito to Afro House now, and now the whole house music genre of it all. And my first project to record on was a song um, that MGM himself actually gave to me. Um, I remember I was complaining to my other brother, Gabriel, um, that there was a certain group I was working with and they weren't doing what I was telling them to do, which I knew would work for them. And I was complaining. I was like, yo, these guys are not doing this. They should have done this. And he got tired and he told me, you know what, stop complaining, just do your own thing. And I was like, for real? Okay, fine. Less than a week later, my big brother, MGM, sent me a song. That was my first song we did. MGM, Mike Mwema, and myself is called Furahia. And I recorded that song. I'd never recorded a song before, but I decided, you know what, let's wing it. I recorded on it, and we put it out. Oh, my, the reception for that song was amazing. And that's when people started noticing me out there. People started, who is this? Who is this? Who is this? And, man, it's been a journey and a half. 
up to this point I'm recording with big names and I'm just like it still feels like a dream um but I thank God for it all that is my short and long story of how I got into recording as a recording artist yeah how did you get into DJing? That's what fascinates me so much. I don't want to say they are not, um, you know, female DJs because mm. there are very oh. many. I think they are they are not known. So a lot of them are performing maybe smaller events, but they are quite a lot yeah. now. Yeah. But then, obviously, in, in the Afro House scene, like, I haven't seen other female DJs. There's also probably others, maybe you know. Mm -hmm. But then how did you even get into DJing? And So, yeah. Um, so DJing, and this is uh, my my best friend from high school, Stephanie, reminded me that even from high school, I used to DJ in my head. So I'd be walking from lunch, and I'm just doing mashups in my head. I'm just like, hey, this song could go with this one. Hey, what do you think of this one? What do you think of that? And so I got into DJing in 2020 officially as a result of necessity. Why? Because... As a vocalist, and this is something that we share as uh, vocalists around Africa, you know, the Lizu is a CEO and stuff. We had been talking, and it, it was difficult to book vocalists for a gig because I don't know why, but I don't know if promoters didn't see the value in booking a vocalist or something like that. I didn't understand it quite. Um, and so because DJing was something that I was interested in in my head, just like playing around with the idea, I decided, you know what, if this is what's going to give me gigs or give me performances, give me a chance to perform and show guys, yo, this is what is I'm doing, this is what you guys should be listening to and stuff. I decided, you know... I might give it a shot. I might give it a shot. Mm. And I remember um, I got a pair of decks from Kral. It's called Kral Africa by Huma Kaseu. He had access to decks by Native Instruments. And so he actually helped a lot of DJs because he used to give out to DJs, go practice, go practice, go learn, go practice. So I was one of those. I was like, can I have decks? Okay, cool. So I was in the house. And also, of course, there's my big brother, MGM. He's also a DJ. He's been doing it way longer. And I was kind of doing what I was seeing him doing with these decks. And I know that, that I remember there's a guy, he's called Ayanga. He used to have, you know, that was COVID time. So we used to have those bushes, underground bushes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> he booked me even before I learned how to play. He was like, the day you learn how to play, come through. You're booked. You're booked You're already. You're booked. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, like, <laughs> I was sweating. I was like, oh, my, will I be, be able to face the people and stuff like that? And then eventually I just called him up and said, I'm ready. Let's do this. And I remember that gig, and I know many people who were there remember that gig like it was yesterday because it was fire. I think, because I already had a catalog of music, all house music, all sung in different vernacular. And then now I'm here, I'm playing both dope music and my music, and I'm singing to it. Guys were blown. And then that was the day that everybody decided to attend that event. Like, it was so packed. I was so scared, but... It was amazing. It was so proper. And since then, again, I started getting guys noticed, started, started calling me up. Yo, we're going to book you here. We're going to book you here. And I was like, I mean, if that works, and I'm enjoying sharing the music, because I still do uh, DJ charts on like different platforms like Track Source and, and Beatport. So this is also, and, and, and playlists on Spotify. So it was like, huh, I might as well play my charts and my playlists live to people and people still enjoy to this moment it excites me to do that oh yeah so exciting so exciting oh my god so which one do you pre do not prefer but which one do you enjoy the most or you just enjoy mashing it all up together it uh, depends i think it depends i don't like uh, okay i don't want to say i don't like singing in all the gigs but yes i i prefer not to sing in every other gig like if especially if i have consistent gigs happening um, I prefer to, you know, make it specific for this is a gig that I want to perform with vocals. This one, I just want to rock it and just fire with people, you know? <laughs> so that's for me. Uh, it really depends on the gig and, and, and how I want to deliver the music to the people. Mm. Yes. So you were quite, you know, celebrated, especially among the Afro House lovers and all these gigs I spoke about, like the 
like beneath the baobabs, kaleidoscope, gondwana. You know, you played at gondwana a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Even um, last year, there was a really dope event that was at the African Heritage House. So what's the kind of experience when you're, you know, playing at these venues, you know, when you have people who've been following Tina from day one, you know, when you have people who love the genre that you love, yeah. you know, love your sound, what's, what's just the relationship you have between, you know, performance stage and the audience? Um, one assurance I always get that I played a good set is the aftermath. Like, you're done playing, and the ripple effect of compliments and yo, 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 Tina, yo, that's what I usually, it usually gets in my brain. I'm like, so that was a good set. Like, I don't even have to get it from the promoter. I don't have to get the compliment from the promoter. As long as I get it from the crowd, like, after my set. Because you, you find... Four weeks later, somebody's still telling you, yo, that set from when was, was, a fire. was fire. And I'm like, huh. So you can still remember what I played. And so for me, I remember when I got into, when Gondwana hit me up uh, for the first time, I was scared. I was like, what? say what? <laughs> <laughs> I would be scared. <laughs> it's Gondwana. You know? And then for Gondwana, they're the, they're the type of people to, when you're debuting, they'll probably put you at prime time. So they gave me prime time, you know. Eight. That's dope. That's a really dope curation, but again, very scary at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Especially because, you know, we, we always had this image of Gondwana is V, of which they have created a precedence for years. And I hear people who never used to like house music, like, are you going for Gondwana? I'm like, since when did you like house music? Like, So I respect them for that part. And so when you hear, yo, can't play the first time I went there, I was I was shaking, but hey, I pulled <laughs> through. I did, and guys had fun, and I'm glad that I got to do also the live vocals and stuff. Guys had a blast. Tina, yeah. Tina, you are just so amazing. You. you know, congratulations for everything that you have done and continue to do. Let's talk about the global presence. You know, even before the collaboration with DJ Sbu, you've had some key collaborations, you know, with other artists from Italy, from the UK, mm -hmm. from, I think, Mozambique, yeah. um, and so on and so forth. So tell me about these collabs and oh. how they helped, you know, just grow Tina's music yeah. because you're one of those key Kenyan musicians who I feel we need to make more noise about because you have had these major accomplishments, some global accomplishments, which some Kenyans even or East Africans might not know well. I mean, you were named, uh, ranked number 224 out of 500 of like um, top artists in the EDM scene, you know. So those kind of things, you know, make me so proud and you know, just makes this podcast make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as I said, after my first project, Furahia, it was called Furahia, I started getting noticed by people. And there's this, uh, the biggest platform that houses uh, house music is Traxos. And so you get house heads in Traxos so much. So as soon as you upload your music and it's doing well on Traxos, you get attention. Mm. And so that's what was happening with my second and third uh, songs that I got out. People on Traxxas were looking like, hey, who's this vocalist? Because guys are there to buy music. It's like mm. an iTunes. Guys are there to buy music. And so I started getting guys from SA reaching out to me, guys from Morocco reaching out to me. And I was just like, yeah, cool, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it, let's do it. And the more I collaborated with these guys, the more I got noticed, because they have their own markets as well, I got noticed by more and more people. And where I have, I don't know which part of this world, I don't know, I'm yet to reach which part of this globe that I haven't collaborated with, but like, I know I have I've done America, like, you know, I'm an NR of Pascal Records, which is based in US. I'm a very good friend of the, of the label boss, Mr. Eclectic. He loves my work. He was like, yo, Tina, man, let's just work, you know. He trusts my ear when it comes to curation and stuff like that. Um, Cairo. Worked with Cairo in the most interesting way. But I worked with Cairo. I've worked with, oh, my big names. Uh, I know this year you'll be expecting a new name is PPCS. Um, he's currently based in Bali. I might go to Bali. 
<laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> but yeah, so all these names, like, and the internet just makes it feel like it's all in the palm of your hands. Mm. You can talk to anybody. People mm. just hit my DM up and, you know, let's do this, let's do that. And, and I'm always, for me, it's about the vibe. Whatever you give me, is it, first of all, does it slap? It has to slap. Because the more it slaps, the more I get inspired immediately and I sing to it immediately. And I enjoy singing in vernacular, as I'd mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, this is something, as I said, I picked up from primary school. And I realized, if I could sing in all this vernacular uh, in primary school, why not transcend this into recorded music that goes global? Because, <clears throat> sorry, we're used to listening to Zulu music, Kwaito, and, and all that South African uh, lingos and music. And I'm like, but East Africa, we've got like, what, over 40 languages? Come on, guys, you know, let's... That's why my tagline is transcending East African narratives to the world. And I try to sing traditional songs from Kikuyu land, traditional from Luo land, traditional from Luya land, and all that stuff. And I bring it out to the global stage. And it's worked perfectly. Funny thing is, guys out there think I, sing, think, I think I sing in Swahili only. But I'm like, all those are like four different languages or five different languages. But it's amazing because people have told me they don't understand what I'm singing. But they feel what I'm singing. And I try to bring out that spiritual aspect in everything that I sing. Mm. Life stories, traditional music and stuff like that into my music and mm. it's worked well so far and and I know my collaboration with Spoo was uh, m my first official song in English purely in English like from start to the end and I mean I got motivated to know oh yeah I can actually do this in English you know <laughs> <laughs> I can actually do it in English because I know someone somewhere back in the day discouraged me in yeah. a way to sing in English uh, but once I did this song, I was like, oh, what? guess what? I can do it. Listen, I love that. This is this is the this is the reincarnation of, you know, the original, our original roots, you yeah. know, our original um, heritage, exactly. you know, languages. It's like for some people, English comes first in their minds. But, you know, inherently, our traditional languages definitely came first. Yep. So to hear that you've managed to create you know, your career using traditional languages, Kenyan yeah. languages is something so phenomenal, like kudos. Yeah, so I, I try to keep doing that. And, and so you have to like study the different languages yeah. and definitely talk to other people mm -hmm. who are from those tribes yes. to say, tell you if you're pronouncing exactly. properly. Exactly. It's a because lot of work. I, yeah? it, it is, because the truth is I cannot speak these languages. I cannot. But what's my goal? My goal is to transcend this narrative from you. And I know because I know this song is going to go on a global stage, European market, American market, Asian market. Hey, it, we, it doesn't have to always be a Zulu or whatever. Yeah. Or how about let's just maybe there's Kenyans in diaspora listening to this and they're like, eh, what? You know, yeah. somebody maybe has attended a Tomorrowland somewhere and then they hear Kikuyu there. Like, am I, am, you know, that mm. effect. And so, yes, the process is, can become hectic, but I'm trying to ease into it. Uh, I, I, I speak to my friends mostly, you know. Um, you listen to a song, and because, you know, we have been raised around all these languages, so we mm. know all the intonations, how they sound oh, like, you know, how they sound like. And so you listen to a song, and there's a certain groove you get in your head, and you feel like, oh, this would sound nice in this lingo. So you write it, you translate it. And in the translation, you have to figure out how to say it perfectly. And so that's where the process comes in. But for some, somehow I've found myself um, reducing my time of recording. Uh, my contracts long time were like, give me a month <laughs> to figure this out. No, this is like, ah, two weeks, I'm done. You know, I figured it out and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I, I love the fact that guys are accepting it. And, um, and Kenyans are actually proud of you know, this thing where we are pushing our own cultures out there through house music, which is a global language, and people are enjoying it. And it's time for, you know, as we said, it's time for Africa to rise and yeah. speak out and tell their stories out there. Mm. That's what I'm trying to do every day. 
Such a pro, such a pro. Who who are the ladies in 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 your scene, Afro House, especially DJing? Mm. I I actually haven't seen any, but are there some that we should know of? Yes, well, there's the veteran herself, <laughs> DJ Ivy. Of course. Yes, DJ Ivy is a proper DJ. Um, as much as she does, she can do all African genres. Yes, yes, yes. She's good in Afro House. She's good in um, I'm a piano, yeah. especially. We have Vidza. She's also yes. a veteran. She is, is it Vidza related to um, Olivia Mbani? Yeah. Yeah, I think I they're think cousins. cousins. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, yeah. yeah. I used to think they're sisters. I don't know. Yeah. Why, There's a resemblance. Exactly. Yeah. So they're cousins. Um, there's Vidza. And again, she is now the veteran when it comes to females in DJing, in house music. She's got residency in Muse. She plays almost all Gondwanas, all whatever. So there's Vidza. There's she. She she is <laughs> <laughs> she she yeah she, <laughs> she. Uh, not she she there's she she a DJ she, she want, not and then there's she okay that's S H I who is also a dope uh, DJ when it comes to house music I respect her the way she curates her mm. sets and stuff like that um, there's more people upcoming. Oh my God, if I'm forgetting anyone, I know they'll slap me, but... No, it's fine. <laughs> if, you're, if you're forgetting anyone, you know, please reach out to me and VAP Access would love to host you here. Yes, yes. There's also upcoming one, like Leleti. Leleti is a house head like mad. And, mm. and she's always followed my stuff and always been inspired with my stuff. And she and her husband are... DJs. Ooh. Yes, so they have this. What a combination. Yes, they have this <laughs> cute duo that they usually do together. And so, yeah, she's one of those. There's uh, Muthoni. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's also, um, there's an event actually mm -hmm. called Sirens. It was, it's by Ivy, I think, and she. And it's for ladies doing house music. Mm. I mean, th that space, I love it because they called me for one of the gigs last year. So dope. Woo -wee, the vibe is mad. It's amazing. And, and I'm, I'm kudos to them. Uh, congratulations to them. I, I love the movement and I wish they just keep on pushing, man. Like, That's so dope. Really dope stuff. That's so dope. So 2024, you talked about, you know, major collabs still coming. You might be traveling to different parts of the world yes. to collab with, um, you know, those who want to collab with you. Yes. What else should we look out for? More music, of course. Yes. More music. Um, EP, for sure. Mm. Um, but mainly more music, more performances, bigger collaborations. I'm even scared to, like, you know, put it all together in a statement. But, yes, more music, for sure. Um, mm. A lot of creativity, you know, because as artists, we are not done as a creative, you're always transforming yourself, showing yourself in a different light and mm -hmm. all that stuff, as long as it's, you know, just flowing organically mm. and stuff like that. So, yes, 2024, more creativity, more music, more visuals, all that stuff, for sure. I mean, more power to you, girl. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming to VAP Access. Thank you so much. That for was the me. amazing Tina Dor. I feel like I'm not done with this interview, even though we're done. So we definitely, I definitely want to have a part two when yeah. you know the journey keeps unfolding. For sure. I just want to, you know, thank you so much for your contribution in the Afro House and just in the music industry period, and even in the you know lifting our languages. Mm. So that's something I'm very proud of, and you are very proud of, yeah. and we applaud here at VAP. Access. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited still. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, and all so the much. best. We'll keep listening to Tina Dora Music. Please follow her on her social media channels. VIP Access is capping off with this amazing composer, musician, DJ, and just all round cool personality. Next week, I'll be back with yet another amazing individual. Bye. Bye. <laughs> VIP Access Season 4 is proudly supported by the Australian High Commission.